Welcome to Asia Society at the Sundance Film Festival. This is our third consecutive year at Sundance, and each year our program gets bigger and bigger, and this year is no exception. We have two terrific discussions lined up for you, first on documentary features and then on narrative features. And these lineups have been creatively curated by our own Janet Yang, and she'll be sharing more details in just a moment. You'll also hear a special message from our new Asia Society CEO, Kevin Rudd, about a program that we are launching called Asia Society at the Movies. More on that towards the end of the program. Today's agenda with speaker bios, and we have 10 of them for you. All of that is in the link in the chat box at the bottom of your screens. If you have questions for our speakers throughout the program, please use the Q&A box. Janet will be monitoring that throughout the event. We have a wonderful audience with board members, trustees, and many colleagues from our 13 centers across the world. Our longtime mission at Asia Society is to bridge and navigate understanding between countries and cultures. And today we're doing that through storytelling and film. Janet has hand-selected incredible voices from Asia and on Asia, and we are so excited for you to hear from them. Thank you to the Sundance Film Festival, especially to Sydney Ritter, who is with us now. We really appreciate the transformation and all the hard work that's gone into converting this festival into a virtual format and for including nonprofits like ours in these challenging times. And thank you to Harbor for sponsoring this panel. In this world of remote work, if you're looking for a new, fast, and easy way to send, sign, and manage your contracts, please check out harborshare.com. That's harborshare.com. Their CEO, Josh Elks, he's been with us for all three years at Sundance, and we are so grateful for his partnership. Just as a reminder, this event is on the record and we are recording. And now a few words about Janet Yang. She's won awards, a Golden Globe, an Emmy, and she's a governor's at large officer at the Academy. Yes, the Academy. She has deep roots in China. She has worked with top actors and directors like Steven Spielberg and Oliver Stone. She was executive producer of the cross-cultural groundbreaking film, The Joy Luck Club. And today's event reunites her with The Joy Luck Club author, Amy Tan. Janet's most recent project is on Netflix. You can watch it right now. It's called Over the Moon, and it's a beautiful animated feature inspired by the original story of the Chinese moon goddess. We are thrilled to have Janet with us for three years in a row now, too. Janet, thank you so much, and it's all yours. Thank you so much, Margaret. You're a delight to work with, and this is one of my favorite programs, mostly because Sundance is an incredible vetter of projects, as you know, it, the competition is fierce. So I know when I'm watching the films that Sundance presents, they are all top, top quality. And this year, of course, is no exception. I have truly enjoyed the six films that we're going to be featuring today, three in the documentary section and three in the narrative section. It's taken me to different roles. I've learned so much and I've so enjoyed the conversations I've had with those who were involved with the films. So let me introduce them to you now. Uh, let's bring on Debbie Lum, who is the writer and director of the documentary, Try Harder. Debbie, thank you so much for being here. We're going to get to your film in just a minute. Next, we have the subject of a really, really interesting film, a very personal film about Amy Tan. It was made by Jamie Redford. And Amy, do you mind popping up on the screen for everyone to see you for a minute? If, uh, we're... Hoping to get Amy on, and there she is. Amy, thank you for being with us today. And the third group of filmmakers is uh, two individuals from India. It's very early where they are. I think they're uh, nevertheless wide awake. And we have Rintu Thomas and Sushmit. Gosh, I, I just learned how to say your last name, Sushmit. I hope I said it close enough. Gosh. Yes. Thank you all for coming. Did I? Yes. Did you want to correct me? <laughs> oh, no, you're on track. So let's, let's start in, in no particular order, but let's start with Debbie. Debbie's film uh, is an amazing portrayal of what it's like to be a high school student at one of the most competitive high schools in the country. It's called Lowell High School. It's based in San Francisco. And, uh, not surprisingly to many of us, it is a largely Asian, largely, in fact, Chinese student body, and it is heartbreaking and wonderful and funny. And, and the life of high school students already, for those of you who have been around high school students, is always very energetic and they're coming of age. And, but this is a very unique group of students because the school is known 
or has been known for being basically a feeder school to Ivy League colleges and Stanford, <laughs> the one nine Ivy League that, that Chinese parents also really, really like. Tell us, Debbie, why you decided to make this film. Yeah, and first, may I just thank you, Janet, and the Asia Society for inviting me to be on this panel. Um, I started out looking at this topic through the lens of uh, parents. I'm, I'm a mom, I have three kids, and you know, in San Francisco where I live, everyone seemed to be completely obsessed with getting their kid into college, even in kindergarten or before that. Um, so I was really kind of fascinated by the college admissions journey. Um, and then Lowell High School was going to be one chapter in the story. Um, but once I landed there, you know, I just fell in love with the students. And you so beautifully described um, that sort of, you know, watching students go through their senior year, that time when they're just on the cusp of adulthood and the energy and everything, you know, amidst all the stress and the parental tiger mother pressure, <laughs> um, there's still so much energy. And it was just really uh, just exciting to be there. I think you mentioned you started out making a film about a tiger mom, but it ex then expanded to include many students. And it is absolutely fascinating, incre incredibly relevant, because I think we're all aware of the lawsuit uh, against Harvard University about certain kind of discrimination. It's a very, very complex issue. What did you learn from making the documentary about whether or not there is discrimination against Asian students? Well, I think whether or not there's discrimination, it, it has the whole college admissions process has a huge impact on these Asian American students and their identity. So, you know, while we were there, the lawsuit was going on. And um, what we witnessed was um, students who were told that if you declare you are Asian American on your application, it's going to be a count against you. And, you know, if you're going to apply to college and try your hardest to get into a top school and work, you know, work your tail off getting there and, and be a perfect student, the odds are you're actually going to fail. And that's really, I mean, I think the impact on these students, particularly Asian American students who really were sort of, um, not just themselves, but all of their classmates, they didn't, not, you know, not necessarily Asian American students, African American and Caucasian students and Latinx students recognize that that is the case for Asian Americans. So it's this real stigma, I think, that that um, this sort of box, you know, of being the model minority that just gets completely inverted and, and turned into a negative thing, um, which is, it's heartbreaking to see that, you know, and these are the kids that are, you know, going to go on and, you know, run major companies and rule the world. Um, and that's how they're starting out their, you know, their young adult lives. What I particularly loved about the movie is that, yes, they checked off so many boxes. They were involved in extracurricular or played instruments, got great scores, had all the pressure, but they were anything but lacking in personality. And I think that's what the stereotype is that somehow in the process of achieving all these accolades and, and being, you know, at the top of the class, they somehow lose personality. These kids have so much personality and that's what was particularly heartbreaking, you know, and then in many cases, they, they may or may not achieve their dreams despite having gone through all this. And the school seems to be aware that there is some bias. They, they're even straightforward about it. So I found it just absolutely wonderful to watch again, heartbreaking, you just fall in love with these kids. And again, it's a mix of kids. So what, what do you think you most want audiences to take away after watching this movie? Well, I think you hit on one thing, which is that um, all of these kids, you know, not just Asian American kids, but all of these students, they're so much more than a high GPA or a test score. You know, they, these are just like, you know, pimply faced, adorable <laughs> and also brilliant and inspiring young adults. Um, but it's also, I hope, a chance for all of us to, you know, sort of look at the journey of getting into college um, as a sort of complete process and have a moment to kind of hold up a mirror um, 
on what we're doing so that we can sort of see what the impact is. On. I so appreciate your work for the complexity and unexpected nature of it. And the other film of yours that I absolutely love, of course, is is it called Mail Order Bride? Forgive me if I've gotten it. <laughs> that, that, that's the narrative, I think. Mine is a documentary. It's called Seeking Asian oh, Females. Seeking, that's right. Seeking Asian Females. Forgive me. Seeking Asian Females is <laughs> a documentary that Deb made, which is about a, a, a Caucasian man who finds his wife uh, online, a woman from China, and the unexpected twists and turns that their relationship takes. And that too was a beautifully complex movie and again, full of, of, of unexpected twists and turns. And so thank you so much for bringing these stories, humanizing Asians in that way. I highly, highly encourage everybody to see both that film and Try Harder, which is at Sundance 2021. Thank All you right. so much. Yeah, we'll, we'll bring you back on in a little bit, but next I'm going to ask Amy Tan to come to the screen. <laughs> This is, uh, it's fun to have all the rewards of Sundance without having to bundle up. I'm, I'm enjoying being indoors and being able to see all of you. Amy, um, I knew a lot about your life, but there's so much more was revealed in this documentary made by your friend, Jamie Redford. If Jamie were still alive, which he's not, may he rest in peace would be on this panel with you or instead of you I'm not sure which because the the film is such a beautiful intertwining of of your personal life and your writing and I think Jamie did an exquisite job of being able to thread this narrative tell us how this film came to be um I met Jamie and we were talking about um the the element of play in our lives and during the interview, he started talking about what I had been through and, and uh, trauma and resilience. And he mentioned that to Karen Pritzker, who was a producer with their film company. And she said, let's do a documentary on Amy. Jamie's role was to come back and, and proposition me. And he had to work, but I didn't want to do it. I just said, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to get away from public attention. And so he, his wife, Kyle, said he was courting you. He just kept courting. He'd bring me lunch. He said, I just want to talk to you a little. And then finally, he's, he was just so damn charming. I gave in. Well, there was something else. There was trust. We, had, we were friends. We had... Um, commonalities in what we're looking at, pain and resilience. Jamie was in a lot of pain and he needed a lot of resilience. And so our conversations were, were really deep. And, uh, and I, I forgot at times that we were making a film and it was just having a conversation with him. And I could trust that he would take all those elements and create a story a through line and narrative about my life. Uh, but I really didn't know where it was gonna go. He just had to take all these disparate pieces of interviews and archives and um, interviews with uh, like my best friend and my husband and then turn that into this film. Well, he unearthed a lot. I'm sure there's even more there that he couldn't include in the film, but being able to track so much of your personal life and your very, very complex family with your father and brother having died and then your relationship with your mother. It was a fascinating glimpse into a really a creative process because so much it seems of the catharsis that you had with your mother came about because you were able to absorb and then write about her stories. So, that seems like it was the beginning of a string of beautiful books that you've written. And I, I don't know if everyone's life could be so clearly mapped out that way, but Jamie did an, just, a, again, an exquisite job of understanding how there is almost no boundaries between what you do in your quote unquote professional life and what is happening in your personal life. But what was it like to, to go through all that and, there, there are a couple of uh, moments in the film where I cheered up along with you as you were talking about <laughs> what 
happens. Now, I always think of, of Joy Luck Club, you know, personally as being my mother light, L-I-T-E, you know, and that a lot of people don't really know what my mother was like. Uh, we talked already about some tiger moms. My mother was not a tiger mom. She was a suicidal mother. And she did say, try harder. I'm really looking forward to seeing that film Debbie put together. But it was try harder or I will kill myself. And I got to see her try to do that a number of times. It, it was also looking at the trauma in our family, father and brother dying within six months when I was a teenager, um, being sexually abused by the minister. All of these things that Jamie was trying to make sense of. And, and, and illuminate my life to see why it was that I became a writer. You have an excess of material based on trauma, and yet you cannot write simply about trauma as your only theme in a story. And I think what we bonded about was the nature of how we take pain and suffering and make something greater, whether it's through play or through story, something creative. Uh, so it was, it was two, I would say, two writers talking, talking to each other, only it was Jamie, the writer, who was going to decide what the story was. For those who don't know, Jamie was quite ill the whole time he was making the documentary, did not even know if he would be able to finish it, but already had a really strong vision for it and was able to leave behind notes of what he would like the film to be should he not survive it. But for you, Amy, what was surprising when you finally saw the film since you left so much in his hands about how to thread all the elements together? I, well, for one, first of all, I hate watching myself on the camera. I've never looked at TV interviews or anything that I've ever done before or listened to radio shows and Jamie used a lot of that so I'm watching this and, and in the beginning I'm kind of cringing and then I got used to it I'm, I'm now somebody watching this film and every now and then I, I have the realization this is my life I was really touched by the things that he chose because he could have taken things that were maybe uh, a little bit more what somebody wanted he he interviewed my best friend not famous people he he interviewed um my editor uh and and he kept it real um but i will tell you that the first time i watched it it was pretty much finished it didn't have the music on it didn't have all the animation but it was a finished film and i watched this jamie had sent me an email saying I didn't want to send this to you until it was finished, but it's necessary to send it to you now. And I watched it. Thank God I watched it that evening. And I sent him an email that evening telling him how grateful I was that he put this together, a film that helped make sense of my life and to see the continuity of things that had happened. I didn't hear back from Jamie, which was really, really unusual because he would get his antenna up if I didn't answer him right away. So he didn't hear back from him. Finally, I sent an email to Kyle, his wife, and he said, and he said, I'm really worried. I'm worried something's gone wrong. And she said, your intuition is correct. Jamie is dying right now. And he, she said, um, he got your email and he read it aloud to her and to the, the producer, Karen, and then to his kids. And then he closed his computer and he didn't open it anymore. And he cut himself off from the outer world and he died a few days later. Well, there was hopefully for him a sense of completion. Yeah, he's hearing from me right before he died was huge. And by the way, this is a totally appropriate moment to give a shout out, not just to Jamie, but to the entire Redford family. As you all probably know, Sundance is the brainchild of his father, Robert Redford. We owe him so much, 
so much. I'm tearing up now. Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. It's so many for giving a platform to so many yeah. new voices, you know, to so many first-time filmmakers for making people so excited to see these new works every year. I mean, the buzz of Sundance has not died, despite the fact that we're all watching the films from our home on our computers. But um, what he has built, and, and I think Jamie's legacy very much reflects what his father's mission always was, is, is really similar. And what a great gift. It's, it's too bad. Somebody needs to do a film about his dad or him in the same way they made a film about you, which, by the way, is very <laughs> Matthew's film. We should all be so lucky to have all the dots connect in our lives. I think we all search for that. We search for meaning. Yeah. We search for that, the, the sense that despite whatever our decisions are, foolish or wise, that they were meant to be. And, and that's very much what we get from watching this film about you. So I'm sure at times it was not pleasant or annoying to have somebody follow you around. Maybe, maybe it was fine. I know I would find that a little bit challenging, but I'm so glad that you and Jamie together were able to produce this incredible work. It will be seen on American Masters from when on, please. Do you know? Yeah, it'll be, I don't know the exact date. It will be in May. Um, and and they said they want to run it in its entirety, so the the length of it, which is fairly, it's not it's not forty five minutes, so um, so it's nice that they're going to run the whole thing, and that's another big coup. I, I you know I wish I'm sure Jamie's around somewhere. He says yeah, you know, running the complete uh, documentary. What a dream, you know, for for somebody who does this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, you mentioned Sundance and I wondered at one point, oh, it's a shoe in that he would get this into Sundance. And he said, no, he said, in fact, it works against our film because there is a huge effort not to let favoritism or nepotism become mm -hmm. part of this. And he said, so we have to, you know, stand in line like everybody else mm -hmm. to get the vaccine, to get the <laughs> documentary. Yeah. Um, seeing if somebody, you know, would choose it. And so we're very lucky that that happened. Uh, and I hope people think, you know, I, I didn't make the film, so I, I'm not trying to brag about a work of mine. It just happened to be the subject. But I hope they do see that it has its merits and deserves to be here at Sundance. I think very much anyone who's examining their own life Anyone who has a creative endeavor, anyone, that's pretty much everyone, I hope, yeah. will get something out of this film. Mm -hmm. And uh, really, I think, have that much more respect for you and your work and how you've been able to embody your life experience into it. So thank you so much for thank letting me film you. Thank you. All right. Next, I would like to bring onto the Zoom stage, Rintu Thomas. And I'm afraid to say your name now, Sushmit Ghosh, 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 is that what you said? It's Ghosh. Ghosh, Ghosh, okay, forgive me. Ghosh, yeah. So this is yet another amazing film, Writing with Fire. It is a phenomenon that I had not known about. A group of women from the untouchable class in apparently a region of India, Delhi, which is uh, particularly unprivileged, I might say, right, if I'm not mistaken, they managed in the early 2000s to create a publication. I'm going to attempt to set name the publication Kabada Lahiri, something like that. But they, they were uh, from a very, not just contemptible, relatively uneducated class, and they managed to publish news to do investigative journalism, where Rintu and Sushmit catch this amazing group of women is when they decide to go digital. So why don't you describe the film and why you made it and what you learned along the way? So the film is um, really um, the journey of this newspaper. Uh, it's called Khabar Leheria. 
and uh, it's set in the state of Uttar Pradesh, which is in the rural, northern rural. Can you speak up just a little bit? I, I assume I, like others, cannot hear you quite as well as we'd like. You can just get a little closer better? to the microphone, please. Thank you. Is this better? Yes, it is better. Oh. Okay, so the film is set in Uttar Pradesh, um, and uh, we discovered the story on the internet when we saw a, a photo essay, a stop motion photo essay of a woman walking through a rural village in the state of Uttar Pradesh, which is the rural heartlands uh, of India. And uh, we followed, and she was she was distributing a newspaper that she had uh, uh, reported on, um, uh, and. Uh, produced and, and now distributing, and we got really curious. And the fact is that um, this is the story of the newspaper, that's the larger structure, but it is the story of three uh, women at the newspaper. It is an intimate portrait of their lives and really um, in a cluttered landscape, uh, media landscape that is dominated by men, how is it uh, that women uh, um, create a, a digital media force? What is the world that they reimagine look like? And uh, how do they navigate power structures that are designed to keep them out? These are the questions that we were immediately asking when we met them for the first time. And we're so grateful uh, that they allowed us into their lives to be able to tell the story in an authentic way. So Smith, do you want to add anything to that or do you let your, your wife do all the talking? <laughs> <laughs> As all men. <mentioned, laughs> you know, no, I mean, the, the one thing that they essentially, you know, I, I just go back to this line uh, from this philosopher that says that, you know, the, the difference between hope and despair um, is just um, a different um, sort of like way of looking at the truth. You know, uh, it's a different way of looking at the facts, and 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 the work that Mira and her team are doing uh, is is in the midst of the most difficult circumstances, and yet their resilience and their power is just um, so infectious. And I think that is something that drew us to the story and kept us going for five years, and we're so happy to be able to sort of have put this together, and you know. Just a few days ago, we'd driven down to them and, and, and screened the film for them. And we were a bit anxious to see how they would react to this because once you film someone for five years, you know, uh, you look at yourself differently. Uh, and, and, you know, you see yourself, your five-year-old version is very, might be very different from who you are now. And, and, and that was, there was a bit of anxiety uh, just going how they would react. And, and we were so overwhelmed. Uh, with with how they responded to it, so so we feel so happy. It feels complete. Uh, I know it's a virtual festival, but for us to have kicked it off with with that physical screening in such an intimate space in a little hut with a projector and, and you know all of them it was very special. Well, many people feel like they work with handicaps. You know, perhaps they come from a less privileged class, a person of color, a woman, but the number of handicaps that these women work from to be from an untouchable class. And as you describe, if you, if they even cross paths with someone from an upper class, they're not even allowed to look them in the eye. And the fact that these women have overcome all these obstacles and have found the grace and the courage to meet with top leaders, political leaders or police and be able to confront them but in a way that's non-threatening and that is still about fact-finding and truth, knowing that they are being seen by many still as beneath human. That's what I found absolutely extraordinary. And the cases that they take on, they are fearless. They are fearless. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm quite amazed about their accomplishments and, and, I think it's in the film that they now have 150 million views on YouTube. They are a real force to contend with. So when they were still in a print form, they maybe could distribute about 5,000 copies of their newsletter. But now it's gone viral, clearly. What does that mean for them going forward? Are they, are they in danger of being shut down because they're so big? 
or do you think their influence will only increase? I think when, when I uh, look at structural inequities um, around me, I usually respond with a lot of anger. Um, and I don't know, you know, how do I fight systems that are larger than me, but I feel uh, uh, need to be addressed. And I'll pick on the word that you use, which is grace, is what came to me when I, I met the, our characters and, and followed their work is there's a lot of grace. Uh, in what they're doing, because when you're fighting structures and you're challenging stereotypes uh, and systems that keep you out, there is there is an element of energy and fighting. But these guys have been in the long run, they're close to being now 20, two decades of, of running a digital, uh, of, a, of a newspaper, is because they, they have strategies to stay in the long game. Mm -hmm. And anyone who raises a voice, especially if you are a woman um, from uh, the so-called lowest caste in India, you're sort of absolutely invisible. You, you're not, you don't exist. And then when you look people in the eye with questions that need to be asked and a phone camera, that, that is done with so much dignity, grace, and compassion uh, and commitment to the work that is so tough that I think you find your uh, ways to navigate a difficult conversation. Now, what I love about um, their process, which we really wanted to capture in the film, is how do you negotiate with people who don't agree with you? Because that's where change starts to begin, you know? Um, and they, what, what the film is, is really a moment in their history when they transition from print to digital, that it, you know, it begins at that cusp. And we see them navigating so many obstacles. And by, by we've stayed five years with them. Uh, there's a lot at risk. There's a lot at stake, both personally and professionally, but they're in it for the long haul. Um, and and uh, there is a certain kind of forbearance and courage that it takes to do that. Especially because they're not just up against the, the public or people they're giving, but even at home, there's an amazing scene where the husband of, of, of one of the journalists doesn't understand why his wife is not at home cleaning house at night and she's you know doing uh, a different kind of work outside of the house. And the struggles that they must face, uh, being mothers, being wives, as well as being professionals, uh, we, we all know it's hard to juggle, but the juggling that they do is just, Beyond, beyond my imagination anyway. So thank you for bringing this film forward. I, it's such an important one to see for so many reasons. And I do hope that the global community comes around to embrace it because that hopefully will create more protection for these women. They're working in, in such a vulnerable environment all the time. And uh, it's, it's incredible also that your camera was allowed in because there are some very, very sensitive moments included in the film, and I, I can't encourage the audiences enough to watch it. So thank you again for bringing that to us. Um, I'm going to take just a few questions from the Q&A chat room. <laughs> and one is for Debbie. Debbie, maybe we'll bring Debbie back on screen, or we can, let's get everybody together, Amy and Debbie as well. Can we do that? Just because that way people might feel more comfortable asking questions. And if we only have a few minutes, but this question is for Debbie. Someone, from, someone named Alvin wants to know, how did you get permission to film inside the classroom? And also from parents, there are amazingly private scenes of when kids get news of, of the, the, uh, of, of whether they're admitted or not from colleges, but also these private scenes of parents and children. Oh, I don't want to give it away, but I do have to say that that one scene at the dinner where the mother actually tried to bribe a college admissions officer. I mean, things that are absolutely incredible. How, how, how did that come about? And aren't, weren't they worried about the protections of their stories? Well, Alvin, I love how you are asking this question. One of our main characters is named Alvin. Um, and um, yeah, I'm not gonna, 
uh, give away a spoiler, but um, as far as that particular scene goes, it's, it's very complicated, but um, they were really open to speaking with us, the students and the parents too, I think because they understood what an important topic this is for, you know, especially for the students who are Asian American um, and that, you know, it was important to have this out in the open. Um, but it certainly helped that, you know, we, um, we worked with people who were willing and um, wanted to share the story. And I, I don't believe in making documentaries with subjects who aren't willing. I mean, that's the most fundamental thing. Um, and we spent a lot of time there. <laughs> we, we relived high school in the making of this film. And, um, you know, I think everyone really trusted what we were trying to do, so. Trust is key to our talking to other documentary filmmakers, really. It's all about trust and getting people comfortable, disarming them. And sometimes, as Amy was saying earlier, you forget there's a camera rolling, right? In, in the best of situations. The next question uh, is from Ines for Amy. Can you please, very touching question. Can you expand on your process of interpreting trauma through craft? And then how are you able to take care of yourself while doing this? Yeah. First, let me say that writing, um, writing fiction is not the same as trying to do therapy on yourself, but you do exploration or I do exploration of past experiences. I think in the way that somebody might approach a memory that has now led to PTSD. A lot of those uh, moments that I went back to were very emotional. And by taking the core of the emotion and examining it, examining it I would go back into what that memory was and just live it moment by moment until I got to the turning point, which was usually a recognition of something. It seems like I, I've arrived at a place, but it's really a place I've always been. It's a recognition of something inside of me. And I know that I have transformed it for myself because I'm glad that uh, for everything that's gone on in my life, everything has made me who I am. And knowing that I wouldn't want to say, oh, if only that hadn't happened, if only this had happened instead. So the trauma was a prop to get me to examine something that is you know, with, when you have very difficult situations, it really leads to these stories. If you had a happy life, I'd be very, I have very limited stories to tell. Um, but what made me who I am are these more difficult times. Mm. A second part to uh, the, this question, perhaps is from someone else named Reeve, is how did you reflect or how has uh, seeing the film caused you to reflect differently on your life and how you see yourself? I was more touched looking at the videos of my mother that Jamie came up with. They were on VHS tapes and he had them digitized. And then to see them again was to remember my mother um, in one way and then to see her and say, you know, there's a little bit of, of a shift here in what I remembered. And I, she just seemed so much more vulnerable to me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I could also see this sense of wanting to both please her and hide myself from her. So it was, I would say it was mostly in looking at her as opposed to my portions where I'm talking about a time when she, well, I'm, I guess I'm not supposed to say these different things, a time when she almost killed herself and putting myself in the imagination of who I was at the time and recounting it moment by moment of what it looks like. And so what Jamie did with the animation is make that thing just come alive so that it was as though I was back in that moment again. That was, that was, it was cathartic, I would say. I was gonna not say that it was fun. It was cathartic. And, um, and I was reminded of how much I was in the moment when he was filming this thing. Um, yeah, so 
well, you're, you have some distance from it now, so maybe you were able to look at it in the way that you weren't. I'm exactly alive. <laughs> yeah. no, I, would, I, I, I do have to say that when I would be writing about these things, um, and Jamie derived a lot of material from a book called Where the Past Begins um, that was un an, an unintended memoir. It was supposed to be a book about writing, and it ended up including a lot that made me a writer. It, it, what informed my language, the way that I put things together. Mm. Um, but at the end of the day, when I finished writing about something, like the moment that Jamie included in the film, I would be shaking. I'd be shaking for about a half an hour. Mm. And I think that shows how deeply I went back into the memory and what the trauma was. And the trauma was also included me trying not to show any emotion and to keep things together. And I got to just fall apart when I was writing it many years later when I'm, you know, 68 years old or whatever. So um, I have held it together for wow. the child. <laughs> wow. It's a, it's a beautiful thing to have, to have for, for future generations. Do I have time for one more question for Rintu and, and, and Sushmit, which is simply that, um, has the film been seen in India and what's been the reaction or what are your plans for that? So we were hoping to bring the film back to India later in the year. So Sundance is where the premiere is. And uh, uh, the, the festivals that we're looking at having it are towards the end of this year. Mm -hmm. So we are very excited to see how audiences here are going to respond and react to Mira and her journalists. I, I can't wait to hear. Please keep keep us all posted because that should have a, a very strong impact, I would imagine. Thank you all so much, Debbie, Amy, Rinchi, and Sushmit. This has been such a wonderful conversation with all of you. And again, your films, Cry Harder, Unintended Memoir, and Writing with Heart. Amazing films, each and every one. Please go see them. Thank you again. Thank you. And stay tuned Thank for you. our next portion of the program where we'll look at some narrative features. Okay, we're ready to start the second portion of our program where we're going to introduce some of the narrative features at Sundance 2021. Let's bring on first Christopher Yogi, Chris Makoto Yogi, who is the writer-director of a film called I Was a Simple Man. Next, I'd like to introduce you to the two stars of a movie called Marvelous and the Black Hole, my buddy Leo Nam and the lovely Mia Cech. Can you bring them on as well? I see Leo and there's Mia, yay, hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Last but not least, we have joining us from Thailand, Baz Pumparia. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. But Boz, I know, is right. Did I do okay, Boz, with your name? You're doing very good, <laughs> Janet. Thank you. Very much. So let's talk first about, if we may, let's take a little trip to Hawaii. And Christopher Yogi, um, please come back on so we can talk about I Was a Simple Man. There's been a lot of talk lately about Pacific Islanders and whether or not Mainlanders can get it right because for so many mainlanders, a trip to Hawaii is one of just fun and surf and fun and games. But Hawaii obviously has a much deeper culture and it probably takes the most filmmakers like you, Chris, who were born and raised there to reveal all the layers and beauty of, of that culture. Tell us why you were inspired to make I Was a Simple Man. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I, I mean, that one of my goals is to really invite folks from around the world to see my home, Hawaii, in a new light, you know, um, to consider it in new ways and consider the rich history and the rich stories and culture um, of the islands. Um, this particular film is a very personal one. Um, it's the story is about an old man who's on his deathbed, uh, visited by the ghosts of his past. And it's a it's inspired by my personal experience with death in the family. Um, I went through a period in my life um, a little over 10 years ago where I lost um, a bunch of people in quick succession. I lost my father to cancer and then I lost a grandfather to suicide and then another grandfather to cancer. And it was just a really disorienting um, 
really strange time and I don't think I had the tools to really deal with it. Um, but what stayed with me was um, this feeling of being in the room and being in the presence of someone who's passing over, of someone who's passing on. Um, it was a feeling that was very terrifying for me at the time, but yet very eerie. And um, in retrospect, really, really beautiful. And so I, I, I just held on to that feeling. Um, and that feeling is really what I was trying to capture in this movie. I was a simple man. Um, and I think, in, I mean, in now, now that the film is done, I think I'm looking back and, it'll, and making the film was also a way for me to process um, a, lot of, a lot of what was going on in my life at that time. What struck me about the film were a couple of things. One is I really felt like I was in Hawaii meaning that the way you shot it, the landscape, the, the way the trees were blowing in the wind, everything felt so different than uh, the way that either films, other people have shot Hawaii or the way that uh, other, other films just in general portray landscape. There was such a, a feeling of really being there. That I felt the tropical breeze coming through. I'm sure that was somewhat intentional. Tell us a little bit about and how you decided to shoot that movie. Yeah, no, I, again, like I, I love that you said that because it very much was a goal of ours in the film to really transport you to the islands and make you feel as if you're immersed in the spirit of the nature, in the spirit of the culture, and you really get to know the people there. Um, and, you know, um, one of the things uh, that, that I feel when I'm, um, when I'm in Hawaii, when I'm at home, is I feel this intense connection to... Like the, 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 the nature um, in the islands, I, I feel more deeply for whatever reason than I do in other spaces. Um, maybe because I was born and raised there, um, but maybe because it really does have some sort of specific, unique power. I mean, uh, people who visit Hawaii, like I, I've seen it, like they, you know, they're, they're in awe and they, they, they turn into, you know, it makes people very weirdly spiritual, you know, to, when you spend a lot of time in the islands. Um, and so trying to capture that sort of... Um, that sort of spirit was one of the goals of the film. And we, you know, it's with the sound design, it's with the cinematography. Um, and um, I, I hope it's successful. Well, what perfectly match is what I would consider to be a more languorous piece of the film. And uh, this feeling of the, of the natural environment is the dreamlike quality of the film. And which, which fits perfectly with the experience that the dying man has. And uh, I don't think it's too much uh, of a spoiler to say that Constance Wu plays someone who is, comes in and out of his consciousness. Um, how did you go about trying to create that dreamlike state? Yeah, that's interesting. I'm not totally, I, I mean, I, it was very intuitive. Like I, you know, it's collaborative. It's all about working with the, the, the amazing cinematographer we have, Unsu Cho, who's um, a Korean badass cinematographer, and she is incredible. And I've worked with her now for 10 years. It's working with my sound designer, Sung Rock Choi, who Bob also worked with for over 10 years. And we just have a way of working, a way of understanding one another in a way that, um, you know, I, I'm always trying to capture this sort of dreamlike quality in my work. And I think that they now, we, we now just kind of work as a unit. It's a really beautiful, beautiful thing to have those collaborators. And even with the actors, when we were going into this production, you know, a lot of it was just about being open to the process and knowing that this film is kind of a mystery to us as well. Um, and just being open, opening our heart, opening our gut to just allow the film to really just reveal itself to us little by little. And in that way, um, you know, it's less about the, the director trying to dictate or control exactly the experience and more about trying to just find the film within ourselves, mm. within our, within our, this little spirit of the group that we created. Mm. Because there was absolutely nothing hokey or obvious about going in and out of that dreamlike state. Oh, cool. Of reality and his imagination. It was all very seamless and it really felt like everybody was in the same space and in the same groove about it in terms of the performances, very understated, very, uh, very deep, you know, so there, there was a certain, as if the whole film was at a, at a, at a deeper level than many films and, and you were able to walk through that. So, um, yeah, so congratulations on that. I, I, 
highly recommend this film to anyone who wants to take a, a trip to the real Hawaii and uh, without having to get on a plane. So um, I thank you. And uh, please, everyone, make a point of seeing I Was a Simple Man by Chris Yogi, who is very much of a Sundance, uh, what would you call it? You, 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 you went to the Sundance Institute, right? You're, you were a Sundance fellow, perhaps, but you've had a lot of great support from Sundance. Again, big shout out to Sundance for supporting you and this film. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, they were they were the hugest support. This film wouldn't exist without the Sundance Institute. Great. Can we now bring on Leo Nam and Mia Chek? Hi. 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 Many of you know Leo from his numerous works, Westworld and many, many movies. So he's, Leo has a fascinating background, having grown up both in South America and Australia. That makes him doubly cool. Um, <laughs> I have to say, that's maybe just my personal opinion. Um, and Mia is a delightful actor that is really blowing it up on the screen. And this movie is very much carried by her with the support of Leo. It's a, a quite an interesting movie. Big shout out to the writer-director, Karen Zong, and the producer, Carolyn Mao. Uh, I couldn't get everybody on screen, so I picked Leo and Mia to, to represent the film. But um, tell us first, Mia, how you got involved with this project. Yeah, of course. Um, I was given the script to read, and immediately I fell in love with it. The writing and the way that the character was was written was just so amazing. And it was different, you know, it was different than anything I'd ever seen um, on screen or in scripts before. And, you know, I wanted to be able to portray that and kind of give a different character and give a, a real raw character that a lot of people can relate to. That's not just the perfect student or the, the nerdy friend, someone who is kind of raw and real and that uh, other people, not just Asian Americans, can relate to as well. When I first met Mia, uh, meaning on screen, and she just has a, such a lovely, bubbly, sunny personality. She is not that person <laughs> in most of Marvel's <laughs> in the black hole. And um, it just more evidence of her acting prowess. But was that difficult for you? Or since you've already acted for much of your life, it's easy for you to, as you say, change clothes. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it was kind of, it wasn't difficult to kind of get that anger and, and really like kind of um, put on those clothes, as I like to say, but it was very much difficult to find that where the anger rooted from, the, the grief and the hurt and the feeling of being misunderstood. And the thought of losing someone so close to you, such as your mother is, is, is a terrible thought and it's horrible that anyone has to go through that and finding that kind of that kind of stem of that that kind of uh, pit in your stomach in the bottom of your heart is kind of hard for me because I haven't really experienced something like that but I know that every kid does every kid goes through that period of time where they're kind of angsty and they feel like they don't fit in and they feel like the world is out to get them and that's something that I really kind of talked with Kate about. I wanted to kind of uh, put that on screen and I wanted to understand where it was coming from. It's loosely based off of Kate's own uh, personal experiences. And I wanted to make sure that I was kind of giving that um, to the audience and putting that on the screen, even if it wasn't necessarily written in the script. Interesting. Leo, what drew you to the project? Um, well, I think a lot of what uh, Mia said about the script and the actual project itself, you know, really resonated with me too. It's one of those rare opportunities that uh, as an actor, you um, you see uh, and you feel kind of a, a presence in the script itself and you can feel the movie happening. Uh, and then you have someone like Kate saying, the writer-director, um, that 
is uh, kind of pour, you could feel her pouring her life into it. Uh, and then technically speaking, she has a history of being able to put together like fabulous stories. So you put those pieces together. And uh, for me, it was like a, a no brainer. And I also kind of came in uh, late into the, into the process. Uh, I was a replacement, uh, very happy and very, very grateful uh, for that. I actually called up the actor. Uh, I've known him for many, many years, actually from my, um, my drama school days, actually, in New York. I called him up. Uh, it was a very unfortunate event that happened for him. Uh, but kind of, you know, just to go, hey, mate, you know, this is happening. You know how great this is. Um, and, you know, with his blessing as well, uh, I carried on uh, it was like a relay race almost. Uh, and it was, you know, really resonant to feeling the community come together. Um, there was no sense of, um, hey, I can't believe you got this and what have you. It was like, a, hey, you go and do it, you know, because this is such a really interesting and important story that we haven't seen this facet uh, of our community, of our society. And um, it's always a really beautiful moment when you have uh, a family coming together that is, um, uh, I'm, I'm a newly uh, minted parent. Uh, so I've joined that club of uh, parenthood and to feel how a family can possibly deal with uh, these elements of grief um, and these other layers uh, of life that happens when, you know, some, someone has passed and uh, the unit of the family changes uh, and so do you. Um, and so for me, it was a wonderful experience to really like sink my teeth into something that uh, really, you know, is so enjoyable for me. Uh, and so I hope that the audiences really take away uh, the love and resonance that, uh, and resilience that's inside of all of us. Uh, and that's inside of obviously a family that looks like us. Um, you know, no spoiler alerts here, but you know the the direction that the family goes into by including uh, a new member, uh, it really does um, identify that before in every other kind of film that I'd seen before, you'd only see this one kind of homogenous zone of what a family can look like or what uh, that makeup is. Um, and I think that this film celebrates uh, love and the diversity that is existent here in not only America, but around the world. Um, so I really hope that people really resonate to, to that. And Mia is fantastic, man. I mean, uh, she, uh, it awesome. was, uh, it was a lot of uh, playing off each other. Um, honestly, uh, actually funny story. The first scene I had with Leo and it was a limited amount of time that we had spent together. The first scene I had with him was the most heightened energy scene that we'd had as Sammy and Angus. We hadn't really had time to prepare that, but we kind of just dove right into it. And something that was really great about Leo is that he kind of, um, he brought the energy that I needed to play off of. And immediately, it, like almost in the first take, we, Kate was like, that's fantastic. Like we've got, we've got what we need. We did it a couple more times just for safety, but that energy, like, like Leo is just amazing. Like, the, the setting, the energy is something that I really love it when I'm working with other actors is that with these experienced, talented people, they know how to set the tone and kind of set that energy flow. And that's really helpful for me because I'm kind of young and I haven't really experienced everything. I'm still learning stuff and that's really helpful. So that was one of the great things about Leo. I think what you're both touching on and discussing both the person that you replaced Leo and just working together, the, the one of the most gratifying things for me anyway in, in working on films is the generosity of spirit that often exists with actors and how you really have to open yourself up and receive. It's not just about doing, doing, doing. A lot of it's about receiving and responding. And that magic that happens between actors is, is such a wonderful thing to watch because it you're creating something that's a bit unknown because you know what you know you're doing, but how that dynamic works is is fantastic, and you obviously have great chemistry on uh, this project. Did was it was one of the first scenes a, a big confrontational scene with an argument, and you're kind of at each other's throats. <laughs> um, first scene, I'm not going to give away too much, but the first scene was um, I was actually not even able to see him. I was uh, behind a door. I was like screaming at him through this door and I was like banging the door. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, it was just like, we, he just brought it, you know, 
like he brought the the energy the the feeling the <laughs> the angry dad feeling you know and in this case it was a good thing because it helped me kind of get that angry kid feeling <laughs> and that was one of the like wonderful things that yeah. happened you know like uh the director and I Kate uh came up with uh, a shorthand uh that we needed to kind of dive into um you know as a understanding the restraints of making a film and then layer in an independent film, uh, time and money. Um, it was a really incredible moment to, um, to work with Kate uh, because we together kind of, it felt like a hands-on sculpting of the character of Angus. So from that first uh, scene uh, that we did, um, it, it, it was really interesting to be able to use uh, this shorthand that kind of really grew uh, throughout the story. It was something that uh, I used um, with Kate, which was a, a kind of a, a color spectrum idea, a shorthand that we could use, um, and to kind of kind of go through the color spectrum that a um, a character that the way that she saw the character would be kind of dealing with grief uh, of losing uh, his wife, but then also uh, dealing with the many <laughs> emotions that come with raising a family, um, and then also working and juggling and uh, those elements, and also a, a new love. Um, so I'm really grateful again to Kate and very grateful to Mia um, being able to play together. It really was a dream come true. And then to come to this home of Sundance for me is like a, my first uh, festival home. Um, so, and it's such a, a beautiful moment to, to be received uh, here with this special film. Uh, and then now also, of course, Janet, the one and only, the goddess, um, and to, to be here with the Asia Society, uh, feeling the support. Um, it really is a, an incredible moment. Can I ask you, because interestingly enough, all these three narrative films are about death. In Chris Yogi's film, someone is dying. In this film, someone has died. So it's a lot about how one deals with death. Is that the main uh, theme, do you think? Or what would you like people to take away from this? Because death and magic are, are prominently featured in this project. But beyond that, what, what, what do you think is the most salient aspect of it? I feel like the most, one of the biggest messages uh, for me after just like reading the script and, and being Sammy and filming it was hope that something so tragic and so scary can turn into something beautiful and just, you can find your way. It may look very dire and it may seem impossible to find that light at the end of the tunnel, but if you keep digging, you'll, you'll get there. And that's one of the biggest messages that I feel like is in the film. You know, uh, yeah, sorry. What would you, what, how would you answer that? You know, I would have to say um, that that message of um, the the thread of love um, that we all kind of uh, cling on to uh, really is um, something that is universal. So I do hope that people enter this film uh, with an open heart um, and with a box of tissues. But um, really, like, I do feel like um, that if people are able to take away from this film uh, the reality that uh, love is really what unifies us um, and that no matter what happens kind of to seeing, seeing, saying what Mia said, no matter what happens in your life that you can still find love, that love still does exist um, even beyond uh, whatever tragedies you may face. Um, and I also hope that people are able to see that this film um, is a representation of what's to come in the industry, that you have uh, lead characters like Mia uh, that look like us, um, that have um, these, this interesting and unique, uh, but also rather not unique, uh, family kind of dynamics. Um, you know, for a long time, we were always seen uh, people that were not, uh, that were uh, people of color, were always seen as a supporting role. Uh, and our stories and our voices were only seen in this homogenous way um, as a model minority uh, or just the supporting best friend. Um, or the butt of the joke, and to now see um, characters fully fleshed out, um, families fully fleshed out, dealing with stuff together. Uh, I think 
that that's one thing that I really hope people take away from and want to see more of. Um, because not only do I want to see films like that out there, you know, for myself and my family, um, but, you know, also privately uh, as a, as a creator, as a, as an artist and an actor that's been doing this for uh, 20 years to finally see the industry kind of open up in this beautiful way. And as you know, I can attest to myself, like, yeah, I probably don't look like someone that, uh, you know, has a 17 year old kid, but, you know, with the, the magic of uh, film and, you know, the techniques that we have and uh, the craft that we do as uh, artists, we can make to get, make these films um, that will speak to not only this niche uh, community of Asian and Asian Americans, uh, but a global uh, audience. Um, so that's my, my hope as well. One of the things I really appreciate about the film is that despite the fact that it's an Asian family, it's never discussed. It doesn't have to be. It's not the main thrust of the movie that they're Asian and therefore it's about a girl who's learning to deal with the grief of the death of her mother. And so uh, it's it's wonderful. And, and as more and more projects like this emerge where we are just simply humanized mm -hmm. and as there are more and more incredible actors and more writers and more directors, we can just be human as opposed to being that Asian person <laughs> with a very specific Asian <laughs> experience. So that's a lovely thing. And we are so lucky to have you, Mia and Leo, to be representing this community out there because both of you have done incredible work and uh, have already a significant fan base. And it's so much fun. And, and I'm sure you know that you are changing lives by representing on screen and giving so many more people the opportunity to be, to be seen. So yeah. thank you again. And thank you for this film. Thank you. Yeah, it's one of the things, you know, that uh, you you want to, um, at the end of the day, you'll be able to say and be happy for that, you know, amplifying these voices that have been underrepresented for so long. Um, so uh, thank you to this filmmaker, Kate, and to Carolyn Mao, but thank you also to you, Janet, uh, for the paving the way that you have had, uh, you've done for all of us. So thank you. Thank, thank you very much. All right, we'll see you in a little bit. So next, I'd like to bring on the filmmaker, the writer and director of the film. Oh, suddenly, a, <laughs> forgive me. What is the name of the film? It's so incredible. Oh, my God. Boz, forgive me. I, when, once he comes All right. Up, yes. Here we go. One for the road. Oh, my God. I, I, I just <laughs> blanked. I was so deep into all these other conversations. <laughs> One for the road. Oh, my God. Buzz, this was a, such a very, very interesting movie. And again, about death, about someone who is dying, but how he, uh, how he approaches his own death and how he enjoins a friend to go on a journey with him. Tell us a little bit how you thought to create a story like this. Um, first of all, actually, um, it started off with the opportunity to work with the one and only Mr. Wong Kawai. So um, uh, he, he called me back in 2018 and he said that he, he watched my uh, previous film and he would like to work with me as a co-producer, as a producer. So why not? So I flew to him and, and first we start off with some totally another different project with another, with another story. And you know what, nine months later, he just turned to me and said, um, but you know what, I don't think you believe in this story. I want you to do something that, that you believe in, something that more personal, something that you want to say if you have like your last chance to say it. So that's the start of this project. Um, it all started off um, the question of that, um, who I am and you know, what, are the things that I need to be closer with. I have little time left in life. Did you realize before Wong Kar Wai said that to you that you weren't so deeply invested in that other story? Um, actually, I kind of feel it a bit. But, but you know, because I'm, I'm growing up um, in this career as the um, TV commercial directors. So I'm just getting you to um, getting, getting the brief, getting um, the, the subject from the producer and try to adapt it and try to find a way to execute it as a filmmaker. And I never did 
uh, any kind of personal work before, which I really admire all, all those filmmakers who can, you know, put their sale or their story in the, in the movie. But I never, I never got a chance to do that. So it's a really big challenge for me for this film. Did you find it personally enriching? And was it like a catharsis to be able to tell such a personal story? Um, I, I find it really hard. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's really hard. It's, um, it's like running around naked in the shoot. <laughs> I mean, I mean to, pu- to put myself in, um, in this character and to put my own word into the character and to let everybody hear it, to hear my thought and my perception and my feeling toward everybody. And, but in time, it's really, um, it's a really interesting process and experience for me also. It's like, I'm like as a filmmaker, I'm stepping back to be the third person and looking into who I really am. And it's kind of like changing moment for me also. Mm. It, it actually has some really interesting parallels to the documentary film about Mimi Tan. It's kind of a review of one's life. It's something mm-hmm. that we are all capable of doing at any point in our lives, you know, which is to really take stock of all the choices that we've made in our lives and the, and the consequences intended or not. Right. And I feel there's a, a, an actual similarity to all these films. They, they all are such an interesting exploration of one's existence and perhaps, especially during this time of the pandemic, we've all had time to really reflect, reflect on our lives. And I think this is an amazing movie to watch right now because we don't have to be dying to do that reflection, right? We can do it even if, we're, if our death doesn't seem imminent. Is yes. that what when, you recommend to people or what were you going to say? Um, I, actually, when, when I watch listen to Amy Tan, which um, I'm, I'm a big fan of her, I'm a big fan of um, Joy Luck Cup when I was a kid. Um, the, the interesting thing is that um, Sin is already the personal film for me, right? But when they start, like, the day I finish the script, the day Mr. Wong said that the script is done, it's around the time that I know that one of my really best friends from New York the one that I work with and stay with, and he's new to be my roommate. Got, um, he just di- diagnosed with cancer. Mm-hmm. And he around the same age as the character in the movie and with the same the symptom, you know, the same kind of cancer as the character in the movie. So it kind of like um, I imitate life moment for me and it make this opportunity to work on this project more, um, more, more important to me in a way. And we trying so hard to finish the movie just in time for him. Because mm-hmm. he's gonna come to the shoot and he gonna watch like the character playing and he gonna, he gonna say that, um, but you, you have to finish the film. I, I believe I gonna have like a couple more months left to edit it. I want to see it. But um, unfortunately, uh, he couldn't make it. He, he died before I finished the editing. So, um, and that's why um, I, I dedicate this film for him. Let's see. Wow, there's so many amazing parallels with so many yes. life experiences. You know, more and more, I realize this is weird blending of, fact, of fiction and nonfiction in many of our lives. And we're making things that are so personal that it, it, there's barely a boundary between the two. Um, I have to just ask because many many of us revere Wong Kar Wai. What was it mm-hmm. like working with him? Um, he a really good like um, teacher and the master for me. Because at at first like I heard all this, um, how to say, it, urban legend <laughs> <laughs> about him, right? And yes. I kind of like you know prepare myself to to that to that level of you know like, working with like the grandmaster. But um, it's turned out that he's really, um, first of all, he's super, he's super talented. He really smart and he gave me such a wonderful and tremendous um, comment. And, and lastly, he's really um, honored me as a filmmaker. So he just like, you know, he never fought me to do anything that he wanted to. He just told me a question that I have to answer as a human and as a filmmaker for this one. And yes, yeah, it's, um, it's such an honor working with him. Mm. So you, you had a huge hit back in 2017, I believe, 
that genius. And you said that's mm-hmm. the that Wonka Y discovered you in. Um, what was the difference between making that film for you and this one? Um, like I said, I think it's, um, it's a direction for the film uh, because before that, before this film, um, all my film, all my work in Thailand, it usually based on, you know, I got the brief from the producer and I just try to execute it, try to find a way to, to tell that story without putting my true self in that one. But this one, it, um, totally a different dish. It's tough for me. So, um, I find it really hard for me at first. I struggle to find the story because, um, I, you know, I, I think my life is not that interesting to say the least, <laughs> but I just need to find a way to, you know, be sincere with me and, and with myself and, 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 you know, this is a chance for me to, to put some closure on a lot of issue in my life. So I think that the privilege for me of working on this one. Mm-hmm. So well done, so well done. I feel like I have to make up for the fact that for a second there, I couldn't remember the name of your film. I'm going to say it three times loud and clear. One for the road, one <laughs> for the road, one for the road. Do not forget about this film, everyone. And let's Thank now you. bring back Chris Yogi and Leah and Mia because we have just a few minutes for questions, which are supposedly in this. Anybody have a question for any of these wonderful filmmakers and film talent out there. If not, I will ask the questions. Yes, hi, hi, anybody have hi. Uh, Well, you know, it so happens the, that all your films dealt with death and it is such a fascinating uh, a trio of films with one person, two people who are dying and how one who is, is lost in Chris's film, one who is lost in his reveries and who is, who is somewhat detached from the people around him. And, and his family is trying to figure out how best to access him is how I saw it. And then in Vaz's film, somebody who has a completely different attitude about how he is approaching his imminent death. He wants to go and tie up all the loose ends. And mm-hmm. then... And then in, in Marvelous in the Black Hole, you have someone who's died and the traumatic impact it has, but how Mia, your character, goes and finds a way to reconcile it or, or, or stand your ground somehow. So what, uh, <laughs> three, three very, very different approaches. So with Mia, do you feel that, that uh, escaping into magic i know is it's not just for people who have a traumatic experience so do you have any specific relationship with magic um actually no before the film i had always been interested in magic um i was kind of um fascinated by it and i wanted it was a skill that i wanted to perhaps try and this film was an opportunity to do that and um i got to work with um a magic consultant of the film, uh, also Kate's longtime friend, Kayla Drescher, who is this amazing female magician. And, um, you know, there's not that many female magicians. Now that I think about it, you don't see a lot of them, but she was an amazing woman. And she was so wonderful. She explained it in a way that made it so that Rhea and I could both understand what actually went behind the tricks. And even though they were simple ones that I had to learn, they were still so much fun because you got to see kind of like a behind the scenes look at what happens in those magic shows. And, you know, even Offset, when we were just um, like hanging around a uh, green room or maybe just like uh, in between scenes, Rhea and I would be uh, practicing or uh, trying to uh, add a little more pizzazz to the tricks that we might have to do in the scenes and it was just so much fun and it was real bonding experience. Um, One of the first things that Rhea and I did together, one of the, I think the day we met each other actually, we went to a magic show with um, Kate Sang and Carolyn and um, I don't think Kayla was not there, but we went to a magic show at the Magic Castle, which was super awesome. And we got to just see like these little um, cute little events. We got to kind of walk around. So that was super awesome. Wonderful. Uh, Leo, do you have some upcoming projects that you want to talk about? 
Oh, yeah. Um, so, you know, one of these um, uh, moments that's happened in my life is, uh, so now I'm going to start producing uh, a true life story uh, of this guy called Rudy Cuneo one. Um, so he, it's based off a Vanity Fair article, but there have been several uh, documentaries and news articles, what have you, about him. Um, he basically uh, pulled off the largest wine heist uh, in history uh, and kind of drove up the fine wine market in the early 2000s. Um, and so um, I'm going to play him. Uh, we've got to, I'm working with, together with uh, Effie Brown uh, of Game Changer Films and, um, you know, Dear White People, um, you know, We're Real Women Have Curves, Project Greenlight. Um, so it's, it's been a real... Um, a fascinating uh, journey to to um, you know acquire a project, uh, put this uh, face that looks like us front and center, um, and yes, it's not the squeaky clean model minority that you know we may have seen. And yes, he's been in jail. Yes, all that stuff is happening. Uh, but it, I, I think it also shows a three dimensional kind of you know history as to uh, who he is, why he did this. Um, and the kind of surrounding frenzy and culture that we have uh, around this concept of fine wine or um, uh, taste, uh, so to speak, um, and the kind of devilish side that, that we have. So I, I'm really excited to share that with the world and hopefully I'll be at uh, Sundance and uh, we do another panel with you, Janet. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> excited to see anything that you're working on, Leo. Right. Us, um, what do you hope will happen now with the film? Is there distribution or can you tell people what, what the plans look like for this film? Um, actually, uh, we, we are looking for the distributor right now. And um, yeah, just it's too bad that, you know, um, because I, I, I find that it's such a, um, I, I growing up watching all these Sundance film, and I really wish someday it could go there. And it's too bad it didn't happen like today. But anyway, it's lucky for me and the team enough to 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 get the chance to bring the film over there, and and hopefully that um, someone will pick up the film and it can get the chance to show in in the United States one day. I I certainly hope so. I think it's very very deserving of a of a big global audience. And yes. We are missing that feeling of, of being very cozy in a very crowded theater. <laughs> and the audiences at Sundance are incredible. You come out of every screening feeling just elevated and filmmakers in particular love getting the love, right? But this is what we live with now. And um, <laughs> but, I'm wearing my hat. We're making, are you still yeah. wearing a hat in honor? Yeah, in honor. <laughs> getting it zero <laughs> outside. And Chris, just a final word about maybe Hawaiian culture. Somebody, Rachel Cooper asked, are there aspects of Hawaiian culture that you feel are really critical to share with the audience? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, geez, there, there, there's, I, th I don't think there's one thing. I think it's, I think all of it, like, you know, Hawaii is a place in which we all, we all go to um, spend some time in Waikiki and then leave. But I would really urge people to when they come when they come to the islands to really take the time to learn the history, learn the culture, really immerse yourself, because it has such a rich, um, a rich and and a pretty tragic history. Um, and so to really, you know, tourism is such an extractive thing. You come, you take, you leave, and to make it more like come, take, give, you know, make it more of a dialogue when you're in the islands. I think that'll just make your experience so much more richer. Um, and I would really, really um, urge everyone here to look into um, the, the cinema of Hawaii. Um, there's amazing Native Hawaiian filmmakers who are making incredible work that's really, um, you know, telling the, the story of the indigenous people in Hawaii. Um, other um, local filmmakers like myself and together as a community, I think, you know, it's, it's a multifaceted voice that we're all trying to, um, trying, to, trying to tell. Are these films readily available? Do you have a, a place you can point people to to better see these films? I, I mean, I would look at the, the slate of the Hawaii International Film Festival. They play amazing Hawaii films. Um, look at this last year's slate. Look, BC this past year played some amazing Hawaiian films. Um, so, you know, they're out there. Well, I find it interesting that we're all having this conversation at a time where it looks like there's a sizable group of people that want to keep AMC very much alive and well you've probably all heard. And I think the desire to have that shared experience is as wonderful as all your films are. The 
the possibility of seeing it in a, in a room with a lot of other people because they, they, we can't help but be affected by that. And, it, and the communal experience is one I know that I really miss and crave at this moment in time. But nevertheless, you should all be so proud that you have your films at this virtual Sundance 2021 Film Festival. And in some ways, I feel that there is some benefit to be able to gather bodies. You know, I, I assume, Boz, you were going to come from Thailand, and I assume, uh, Chris, you would come from Hawaii, whatever. But the number of people in our audience today probably spans uh, a much wider swath geographically than would normally be possible if we were actually just in Park City, Utah. So thank you all again for joining. That is the conclusion of this portion of the program. Thank you, Asia Society, for hosting again this third year, and we hope to see you next year. Uh, right now, I'm going to uh, goodbye all, and I'm going to introduce Kevin Rudd, who's the new CEO of Asia Society, the global institution. He's going to say a few words about the new film festival that Asia Society is also going to participate in. An Aussie. All right. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you, Janet, for moderating such a fun conversation. Well, good evening. I'm Kevin Rudd, President and CEO of the Asia Society, and we're based in New York. We are delighted to continue our partnership with the Sundance Festival uh, for the third year in a row and champion leading Asian writers, directors and actors from right across the film industry who are represented as part of this great festival. We also thank our sponsor Harbour for their steadfast commitment to this ongoing collaboration. On this occasion, I'm pleased to announce the launch of Asia Society at the Movies, an exciting new initiative celebrates established and emerging voices in contemporary film in classics and in documentaries from right across Asia and the Asian diaspora. The series builds on Asia Society's long and rich history of film programming. The initiative also serves to deepen understanding of modern Asian cultures, a core part of our mission since the Asia Society's creation. Asia Society of the Movies will be launched on the 1st of February 2021 with a three-part series featuring Oscar submissions from Asia. We kick off the series with Better Days from Hong Kong, scheduled for Monday, 1st of February. This film, a drama and a love story that sheds light on dark societal impacts of bullying and will be accompanied by a conversation between director Derek Kwok Chung Tsang and Janet Yang, award-winning producer and Asia Society board member. It will be followed by a discussion featuring the well-known actor Celia Au and in partnership with Actor Change. Next up on the 5th of March is Leap, directed by Peter Chan from China, followed by a discussion again with Janet and the director. The series is rounded out by the Indonesian horror film Impedagore on April the 2nd to include a dialogue with the director, Joko Anwar, and Rachel Cooper, director of Global Cultural Diplomacy Initiatives. Beginning in mid-April, the program will shift to a weekly offering of the best, brightest and most thought-provoking across Asian and Asian-American cinema. Further information about Asia Society at the Movies may be found through the Asia Society Museum website. Uh, that's uh, to be found on your screen. And thank you for joining us this evening. And I look forward to seeing you at Asia Society at the Movies. Our thanks to Kevin Rudd. We're looking forward to our movie series launch next week. The website that Kevin referred to to sign up is in the chat box, and you can check out all of our Asia Society global programs at asiasociety.org forward slash online. And if you want to follow us on Instagram and Twitter, we're at, at Asia Society SF for San Francisco. A big thank you again to Janet Yang. Beautiful moderation there. Thank you for curating those two wonderful panels. And thank you to all of our speakers. You had and shared wonderful stories and journeys, um, each of you. And please keep us posted on where we can see your films after Sundance, because we're going to be following all of them. And we want to let our audience know, too. So huge congratulations. Thank you for making all of us proud. And to our audience, thank you for joining us live from the Sundance Film Festival. This concludes the public portion of our program. For those joining our VIP reception, click over to the second link that was emailed to you right before this event. We are so grateful again to Harbor and Josh Elks for sponsoring us. And thank you to our team, Pilar, 
Rexel, James, Michael, and all of our interns, and from all of us at the Northern California Center, stay safe. <laughs>